All right, everybody. Hello, this is Claire from Girls That Make Podcast, and we have a special guest today. Her name is Kathleen McDermott. You know, I'm going to start with your favorite quote you gave us. Sure. I'm going to read it. You know, it's, we believe that by skip speculating more at all levels of society, reality will become more malleable by Anthony Dune and Fiona Rabi. And I think what, what the authors are trying to to promote is sort of applying mm -hmm. creativity to problem solving oh. or that, that those things are really related. So mm -hmm. there's specifically, the authors were specifically thinking about climate change mm. and how climate change is, is a problem on, on such a big scale. It's probably a larger problem than, than most people have faced before. And so just trying to think of other ways to approach solving big problems. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're promoting this idea of, of, speculating mm -hmm. which you can also think of as you know Im imagination so, but as uh, kind of as a brainstorming technique that's how a lot of people use speculative design is as a brainstorming technique wow. okay so this ties right directly into your work right yeah it does so it what does. is your current position so I'm uh, working on a PhD so I'm I'm funded as a researcher mm -hmm. at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute um, and my research is specifically on um, how humans relate to robots. Um, and in my case, I'm really interested in robotic wearables and how things like narrative and humor can affect the way people respond to robots on their body or in human life. Mm -hmm. And so part of, as just a quick example, part of what inspired this research was a paper by two other researchers, um, Martina Mara and Marcus Appel, uh, who are in Austria, they did this study in which they, um, they had people meet a robot that was sort of scary looking. That, one, that, that, that was one control group. Okay. And then they had another group read a story about the robot before they met it. And yeah. in the story, the robot um, is depicted as really kind. Mm -hmm. And those people, when they met the robot physically, mm -hmm. reported more positive feelings toward the robot. So it's this idea that, you know, like the narrative and story and context mm -hmm. um, and how things are presented mm -hmm. in technology is important and it affects the way we relate to these things. I see. Well, that is actually pretty fascinating because, you know, a lot of us and including myself, you know, when we think about robots or technology, just something there, something that does a work versus mm -hmm. you know, bring a narrative into it and incorporating into our lives or have a feeling towards that. We don't really think about that part. So it seems like you're doing some work related to that. Yeah, I think so yeah. because um, there's always a narrative, even if it's intended or not. So if somebody designs something for someone to wear, even mm -hmm. if they design it to just solely to, to serve a function, um, there's still going to be some mm -hmm. other effects whether it's how it looks or how people perceive it or how it relates to the body. Mm -hmm. So it's trying to look at kind of the bigger picture mm -hmm. when thinking about designing technology. So you're still thinking about function, but you're also thinking about these other issues. I see. And I mean, it will be inevitable to have more and more technology in our everyday lives. You know, if we think 30 years ago, we didn't have all the things, even, I mean, the microphone I have, you know, you had to buy for a thousand dollars back then. The yeah. watches we have now, you know, all of that. Um, so that's actually fascinating. I've never, um, you know, heard that specific topic of a research. So thank you for sharing that with us. No, no problem. Thanks. Yeah. I'm going to show now our audience your websites. And this website is underarmor.org. And there are a few things. Can we go into the personal space dress? And can you explain to us what it is? Sure. So yeah. I'm going to yeah, get into that. And for our listeners who do not know what you know, who are just listening, let's just try to describe this dress from the beginning. Can you help me with that, Kathleen, please? Sure. So the dress is sort of this, it's like a somewhat ridiculous object because I, I wanted to be pretty over the top with it. Um, mm -hmm. It's got like a lace white shirt, which I've made, um, and a big uh, Victorian inspired collar. And then it's a big skirt that's a gradient from white to pink. And it, um, it has this it has parts of an umbrella inside of it that are hidden so that when someone gets too close to the dress, it expands open the way an umbrella expands open. Mm -hmm. um, and I did that using mostly materials that you can find in the home, some special electronics as well. But um, in order for the dress to open like that, 
um, if you think about how you open an umbrella, it's, it's on a pole basically, mm-hmm. and you push the mechanism to open the whole umbrella. Mm-hmm. So I'm trying to do the same thing in the dress. I was actually trying to pull the structure of the dress up and down right. from the base to expand the arms. Mm-hmm. And so in order to do that, ideally, we'd use a linear actuator, which is a type of motor, that okay. is, but it's very expensive, it's very heavy, and it draws a lot of power. Okay. Um, so that's a challenge for trying to get something in a dress. Right. Uh, so what I found in part through researching through other DIY blogs is that I could use um, deodorant, like yeah. antiperspirant containers. Yeah, right here. <laughs> think yeah, about I see how it. they rotate. You know, if you rotate the base of a deodorant stick, um, then something moves up and down. Oh, I see. So we're going from like a 360 degree rotation. You're rotating mm-hmm. something around, which is what a motor does really well. Motors are really good at going round and round. Mm-hmm. And now we're getting up and down motion. Okay. So we're transferring the direction of that energy, mm-hmm. um, which is a really important thing to do uh, in mechanical engineering. Um, so it's, it's looking for sort of DIY solutions for um, well, sort of big problems. As you know, a maker, you have to just come up with your own tool sometimes. And we cannot afford to spend thousands of dollars just on one project. And this is all again an experiment. And you know, so this lady, she has this dress with like the, the umbrella. So you call it the personal space. What is that? So yes, she also has ultrasonic sensors in the front and the back of her and they, mm-hmm. they can tell if someone comes too close to her. Okay. And we can change what that dis- distance is in the code. The, okay. you know, decide your own threshold of I how see. close someone can nice. come. I see. Um, but so that way when someone comes too close to her, it literally opens. Mm-hmm. And we recorded it in the Hong Kong subway. Yeah. Because we're right. at the time. I'm just quickly showing the video. You can see that her skirt is out. If someone comes too close. Exactly. Yeah. And so it's meant to be both somewhat comical. Mm -hmm. um, Okay. But also sort of probing the limits of of Mm. what we want in our wearable electronics. Mm. I see. Okay. I mean, that, that's the question we also have all the time. You know, what is personal space? You know, we and Hong Kong, especially is a very crowded space. So you have tons of people around you. And, you know, if we want personal space, what we can do. So I understand kind of the, the humor in this and also the societal problem you're bringing into this one garment. So that's why it's art. You know, it's not just wearables at that point is using technology and making a piece of art that has a societal message in there. Yes. So, so those are the things that you do, Kathleen, right? Correct. Great. Now, there's another really fun thing. I mean, this one is fun. So I want to play the video for just a little bit so that our viewers can understand. And for the listener, we're going to describe what it is. Sure. Yeah. And and I just put this video up last week. Okay, great. So what's what's going on right now is a carpet in a living room and there are some little robots that are transporting plants around the floor. So if you think about a iRobot or those like vacuum cleaners that goes around your floor to clean the floor, it looks something like that, but I think they are going towards and away from the sun. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And they're made from mostly recycled materials in their mm-hmm. bodies. So okay. we've got like an orange juice container and okay. a spinach container. Okay, great. So what do they do? Do they chase light? Yeah, so there's a couple interesting things that come up here. Um, they, they have sensors, light sensors. Mm-hmm. And when they receive enough light, they will stop moving. Okay. Which is not exactly the same as chasing light because okay. it's a little bit more random. Okay. So... Sometimes they have enough light and they're, and they're stop and they're still and that usually works. But when the light starts to move, mm-hmm. um, basically their motors will start moving again. Mm-hmm. And some of them are, are veering off in the wrong direction, right? There's a degree of randomness. They just have to run around until they get enough light to stop. Wow. Um, and it creates some strange mm-hmm. behavioral patterns. Um, and so that's to some degree the, maybe the research side of it of why, why I view it as an experiment. I wanted, So I made these ones with... Um, students in a workshop so the students chose you know I made the circuit in advance Mm -hmm. um, and you can see my circuit there is very much improved from the personal space dress this one I designed in eagle and had it fabricated so it functions much better Mm -hmm. Um, so I completed the circuits in advance and then the students assembled the bodies and so they've each done their own design for the shape and Mm -hmm. those shapes cause them 
to move in different ways. So the orange juice bot moves really, really well, whereas the um, spinach container bot is sort of, um, he's much slower and he's leaning back a lot. Mm. Um, and there, yeah, so later on in the, in the video, there's an interesting moment when the sun kind of dries up. Okay. They, they're all trying to get into the same area mm -hmm. and they basically just run each other over and start knocking each other over to, to get enough light, which I really didn't expect. You know, I sort of had this image in my mind of like, utopian yeah, robot like plant robots but yeah, fighting each <laughs> so, other yeah so for me the mm. next question is how, you know how to change the design mm. um both in a, the physical design but also the code mm. to um change the behavior to make them All a bit right. more um, well i think this is almost like the beginning of some sort of movies that's about like robot you know behaving their own way to kind of just survive you know in this world yeah maybe <laughs> I think, yeah. I mean, and then, you know, when I posted it, I always post things online and get comments and stuff. And one of the okay. people who commented said, it's not so different from plants because yeah. plants do compete in the forest for growing different ways, yes, trying to get yes. the light, um, which it's is interesting, interesting to think about because I think uh -huh. of plants as so peaceful, but of course... Okay. I'm Any living thing has competitive too. behavior. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Great. So if you want to learn more, this is cathartic. So K T H A R T I C dot com and you can see all her videos. Now what I see here on your website is what's called the Arduino Uno. Can we just talk about this for a little bit? Sure. So the Arduino Uno, you know, it's a, it's a board and at Girls That May, we use boards, Arduino boards as well. It's not the Uno, it's just there are the many different versions of that. Mm -hmm. And um, can you just tell our listeners who are not familiar with what, you know, an Arduino Uno is? Sure. So uh, I use the Uno when I'm testing before mm -hmm. I move, excuse me, to a smaller microcontroller. Often okay. I use a Nano. Okay. But the good thing about the Uno Mm -hmm. Is that um, so? We've got a, an IC, an integrated circuit, which right. is not represented in the image there. Not here, um, yep. But the, the people who designed the Arduino basically made this circuit mm -hmm. that and allows us to access the individual pins right. on our IC, mm -hmm. or such as power. That's mm -hmm. probably the most obvious one, and ground. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we can access them thanks to these header pins they've added, mm -hmm. and so we can plug into them directly. Mm -hmm. And then we program the integrated circuit through the USB cable. Yep. So the, the Uno is really useful for testing out things like um, reading sensors, controlling mm -hmm. motors. Mm -hmm. um, yep. I, when I first tested, I'm using a breadboard there, which is another okay. way to kind of plug and play. You don't need right. to solder yet. Yep. And, and you can basically test your concept and make sure it works. Mm -hmm. So for your prototyping, you use the Uno and the breadboard. So for our listeners who do not have the image right now, a breadboard is basically a bunch of punched holes in a board that's maybe about 10 centimeter by, by uh, you know, no, 20 centimeter by 10 centimeter, depend on the type of breadboard you get. Mm. And then uh, the Uno is maybe the size of like a credit card or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and there are pins. So you connect, you know, the, the hole in the breadboard to the pin in the Uno. And then that's basically a wire. So, you know, and you program it all that. So then the, uh, what she was talking about, there's a, basically the brain of, uh, you know, the, the Uno that will require codes to get in there to function a certain way. In this case, it was, you know, moving uh, with the light or the dress, you know, with the motor. So... Um, so that's your main prototyping tool. Yes, exactly. So okay. a quick example is uh -huh. for the robots. Uh -huh. I have a sensor, the light sensor, say connected to, to analog pin zero. Okay. And I program my, my Arduino to say, if we're getting enough light, it's a uh -huh. statement, if we're getting yeah. enough light on pin zero, then we're going to send power concept. So thank you for sharing all that, Kathleen. Now, um, I want to talk about, you know, some of the hurdles or the, your journey to become that person you are right now, because it seemed like you didn't start with technology, right? That's correct. No, mm -hmm. I have a background in sculpture, so it's mm -hmm. a very unusual path to mm -hmm. what I'm doing now. Okay. Um, but, you know, I've really found it to be, it, it's, it's not as weird as you would think, mm -hmm. um, because when I worked professionally as a sculptor, uh, my job is really problem solving. Okay. So especially when I worked making 
um, props for films, for example, which I did contract work working with different people. But say someone comes to you and they say, um, I need you to make a fake hand, mm. a fake dead hand so we can throw it around on stage. Mm. The, the problems you're going to be thinking about are one cost, mm -hmm. you know, how expensive, what's the budget? B, what's the turnaround? How much time do we have? Uh, C, how do we want this thing to behave on stage? Mm -hmm. Do you want it to just fall on the ground and, and lie still and you want to use something very stiff and hard? Do you want it to shatter mm -hmm. or do you want it to seem lifelike? Okay. So you have to make all these decisions on what kinds of materials to use mm -hmm. and, and then how to actually make this object. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, if you're taking a cast from life, mm -hmm. you might use a material called alginate because it's safe mm -hmm. to use on somebody's skin. From, you know, the, the, for the mechanical objects that I make, a lot of the problems tend out to be kind of design problems, mm -hmm. you know, how to make things move. It's a combination of technical problems, but also thinking about what's your structure made out of. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why the orange juice robot moves really different from, there's another robot in there that's made from a tape deck. Mm -hmm, I see. That's really, really stable. Mm -hmm. um, and, that, and that's because it's really low to the ground and the person who made it um, had her wheels really stable. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think- You went from, you know, doing sculpture and you said props, to doing an MFA, so we're still continuing with the arts over here, and mm -hmm. then you are now doing an electronics art PhD. Mm -hmm. so, so the MFA was in creative media, so that was kind of a hybrid program. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah. Okay. yeah so yeah. you started to add some como just naturally part of your studies, um, electronics and technology into that. Yep, and there are okay. more programs like that now okay. across a lot of universities, okay. programs that kind of combine art and tech. I see, I see. And how was it to learn like that new skill of technology? You know, for me, I, I really enjoyed it. And I, I felt I took to it pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, the first thing I learned with mm -hmm. programming was processing, which is pretty easy to learn. Mm -hmm. um, it's Java based. It looks very similar to Arduino. Okay. Lots of examples online, and um, I read a book, Getting Started with Processing, and I basically oh, okay. just followed it okay. right through. And I, I felt like that game, you know, it's low-level understanding, but it's still it's enough of an entry point to, uh -huh. to understand right. that, you know, things aren't just magic, but, you know, they're programmed to work a certain <gasps> way. A lot of students use Scratch, which mm -hmm. I think is a good introduction of sort of programming concepts without – having to memorize syntax okay. or anything. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. That's a, uh, you know, different trend that I am seeing. And, uh, and I am originally from South Korea, but now South Korea, the big trend, you know, it was like learn English or learn Chinese. Now it's like learn programming. That's like wow. a big trend. It would be very interesting to see how the generations change. Yeah, right. I mean, now the new generation is born with a cell phone in their hand. And, you know, the modular coding that you're talking about, too, it's just something that they learn in kindergarten now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah everything will change. pretty wild. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so you, you, so you, uh, to cab, you did all of this, this uh, design and creative design, and then now you're focused a little bit more into um, this electronics, electronic art. Yeah. Okay, yeah. awesome. And it's very encouraging, actually. I love the story because a lot of people have MFA, you know, or BFA. Mm -hmm. And if they wanted to get themselves into other fields without throwing that away, it's not as, you know, arts is not a skill that expires. You have that skill. It's a critical, you know, and it's not, art is not just pretty. There's a lot of things you have to think of. You know, what do you want to do? What the purpose of it? And I used to work in art as well. So uh, oh, cool. I, I love it. I love it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think a lot of students graduate if they have a BFA or something and they're very worried about like, I'm not going to get a job. How am mm -hmm. I supposed to be employable now? But you learned that on your own, right? You didn't really have a coach or you went back to school for that. You just learned on the go. Right. But it definitely was also taking the temperature of, you know, what's happening at the time and feeling like, okay, I do need more technical skills. Cause that's mm. Do you have any recommendations for books? You just talked about uh, getting started with processing. Any yeah, books? that's a good one. I think from the same series, there's getting started with Arduino. It's the yeah. same publisher. I don't remember. Is that Make? You're right with the, so it's called, yeah, the make, do they have a make magazine? They have their make, right. publishing, get starting with Arduino. They have get started with, uh, I think, um, wearables as well. 
Yeah, those are really good manuals. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the key is is to not get frustrated and mm-hmm. to and to really start from the beginning if you have no knowledge. You okay. know, it's one of those things where I think they're, those books are designed really well to build mm-hmm. upon the knowledge. Um, another site that's really good specifically mm-hmm. for wearables is called um, How to Get What You Want. Is that the address? You know, I'm just going to exit full screen and, and check. Mm-hmm. Um, it might be Kobakant. Kobakant. Yeah, okay. So it's K O B A K A N T. Okay. Dot A T. Dot E T? A T. A T, yeah. okay. And, right. and the sub, the tagline is how to get what you want. So if you search okay. for that, you might be able to find that as well. But it's, and um, that's, that came out of a research project from a researcher at MIT named mm-hmm. Hannah Perner Wilson. And, and that's a project that inspires me a lot because she's basically doing all these wearable tech experiments mm-hmm. and putting up instructions on how to do them. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of them are kind of smaller mm-hmm. uh, experiments, like sort mm-hmm. of building blocks, like okay. how, to, how to make a sewable button or okay. how to embroider a speaker, mm-hmm. which is really cool. She shows you how to embroider using conductive thread and a mm-hmm. magnet how to make a speaker. Um, okay. It's really neat. Oh, right. um, so some of them don't require as much um, equipment. Some of them do, and they're not all using a microcontroller, mm. which is another thing that I think is interesting mm. is to think about if you're interested in hardware, right? Cause there's two things we have to learn. We have to learn programming, but we also have to learn hardware. hardware. Yeah. Um, and hardware is its own art form. And that actually mm. interests me more than programming personally. I see, I see. So, um, you know, those are great recommendations. And I agree with you because when I started, I read all those books from actually the make publisher. <laughs> They're very yeah. good, just step by step. Very basic. What, it, what is an IC, you know? Uh, you know, you get all this knowledge. Now, let's just talk a little bit more about wearable technology because you are an are expert, a researcher in that. And I think this idea of wearable technology get used a lot. So I hear mm-hmm. that when they talk about, for example, the, the bracelet, the Fitbit or the mm-hmm. iPhone that, you know, watch, those are wearables, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but also the skirt that you made is also wearable. Yeah. Well, and then some people, so um, the, if, if you want to follow the trend of research, because this is one of the questions I've had to answer to mm-hmm. do a PhD is, is what is wearable technology? How do you define it? So if you go further back in time, some people mm-hmm. will say a wristwatch, mm-hmm. you know, is wearable electronics technically, okay. or it's got a, it, well, it is. mine has a battery, but. Even an analog see. in a watch is wearable. Okay. Right. And then some would also say glasses. Mm-hmm. Maybe. And it depends how you want to define it or someone might say shoes, you know, and, um, that's an interesting history to follow because uh, uh, allegedly Mm. shoes and wristwatches were both wartime inventions. So Mm. wristwatches were apparently invented in the Boer war, Mm. uh, which was in the, I believe the 1890s, uh, Mm. British soldiers to help them coordinate their offensive efforts. Because if you don't know what time it is, you can. Totally makes sense. Um, and the same for, for shoes. They were really effective for and important for soldiers in World War One who were getting like gangrene. Mm. So like boot technology was a really important technology to keep people's feet dry. Mm. So like, I think it's interesting to have an expanded understanding of tech because textiles in and of themselves are a technology. And if you think of the first programmable machine, I believe it was a loom, the first manufacturing machine that was ever programmed. Um, I believe was it was a loom. Okay, yeah, yeah, Not yeah. Something fabric related. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're talking about the sewing machines, right? Yeah, the programmable uh-huh. punch cards. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's the first time we have, uh, you know, like programming applied to manufacturing. So I think there's a long history of sort of like textiles mm-hmm. and garments mm-hmm. as a technology. Mm-hmm. Nowadays, we mostly think of it in terms of like smart tech something that's got like an IC or, Mm -hmm. you know, in a sense of miniature Mm -hmm. computer involved. Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. I I take a, I don't know, I take a broader view of Mm -hmm. of what wearable technology is. I think it can be a lot of things. Mm. Wow. Great discussion because, you know, at Girls on Make, we also say we do wearables, Mm -hmm. but this concept of, you know, what, what is the boundary of calling it? Does I'm, is it? We, do we need a chip in there to call it a wearable technology, or, or is it more functionality that counts? 
Um, you know, but nowadays, obviously, I think we lean towards, you know, having something that is programmable or that is mm -hmm. something customizable. Um, mm -hmm. That's that's to but that also means how much uh, evolution there has been. Because, for example, shoes that was a wearable technology, and but nowadays shoes is just everywhere, anywhere, just easy, you know, to reproduce. So now we don't even consider that wearable. But you know, the watches, the smart watches, for example, now are called wearables. However, maybe in thirty years that would not even be a wearable. We we won't even call it because that's there's not enough. That's just something everybody has. Yeah, it's really interesting because it is obviously tech. I mean, we're surrounded by sort of the products of human invention, right? But but if maybe it's what's considered innovative or not, we no longer consider things that are not powered to really be technology. I see. Great. Wow. I'm so glad we're talking about this, you know, with you who is specialist in that and who is a researcher in that. Now, the question I get a lot in my head is what is the future of wearable technology? Yeah, so I think that relates to, I know, another one of your concerns, which is the limitations, but mm -hmm. the future of wearable technology is definitely, I think, going to be somewhat dictated on a couple big problems, mm -hmm. which is one, sustainability, okay, um, and two, power. So both mm -hmm. of those things are related, but, but one of the big limitations is how to power your wearable creation mm -hmm. um, and how to do so in a way that's sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of people don't want lithium ion or, or lipo batteries on their bodies, right? Mm -hmm. Cause we know they can explode, but on the other hand, they're rechargeable. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's a good thing. Nice. Um, solar power has its limitations. You know, you need a pretty big solar cell to get any significant amount of power. It depends what you're trying to power, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, and in an ideal world, we'd use a solar panel to charge a lipo mm -hmm. so that we could store our solar energy. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we've also got, you know, old school mm -hmm. alkaline Better. batteries, yeah. right? Which, which create waste. Um, so, so we've got our power limitations, which are also, uh, also can be heavy. Mm -mm. And then we've got our sustainability question because a big problem in fashion right now is fast fashion, right? It's mm -hmm. things that are going right into the landfill. Yep. So I think a lot of people see wearable tech as a potential space or as potential alternative to the fast fashion culture mm -hmm. that if we're putting tech in, in items, you know, people will be less likely to dispose them and throw them out. I see. But I also think we, you know, if, if we're going to be presenting wearable tech as an alternative to fast fashion, mm -hmm. it needs to also be produced in a sustainable way. So yeah. what, you know, what are the conditions of the factories that are making these mm -hmm. uh, okay. garments or materials and, and what materials are we using? But I think if there's, you know, if there's inventive solutions to those problems, mm -hmm. I think we could really... Mm -hmm. it, I feel optimistic in that sense. And one project I look to is um, a company called Modern Meadows. Okay. And interestingly enough, one of the key players in that project um, is an artist, uh, or formerly an artist turned researcher. Okay. Uh, let's see, her first name is Suzanne, and I just want to make sure I have her last name correct. Do you? Okay. Oh, uh, Suzanne Lee. Suzanne Lee, S U S A N. Yes. L E E. Yes. Okay. So Modern Meadow is um, a leather alternative, okay. and you know they're they're still very much in the research phase, but it, they have funding. Um, their offices are in New York, and they're trying to make garments out of bacteria, so that they're actually made from a sustainable material with a lower environmental impact, which is a really interesting, really wow. outside the box approach yes. that, um, yeah, I maybe mean, isn't immediately profitable. You have to kind of get outside that system too, which is hard. From yeah. a, you know, I'm in academia, so I have the privilege to sit around uh -huh. thinking about this stuff. Not everybody does. And I understand that. But, um, wow. So that is a different type of wearable technology of its own because using bacteria, I mean, this is all science and how do you make it sustainable? Just like you said, and make it wearable. Yeah, so I think maybe that answers your question in a more concise way. What is the future of wearables? Mm. Possibly biotech. Mm -hmm. Possibly. Mm -hmm. If we can get power that way, which mm -hmm. there's a lot of people researching um, ways of getting power from, from mm -hmm. bacterial cells, okay. um, which wow. again, very low power. So is it applicable yet? We don't know. But 
that so, could be interesting. Um, you know, just for our listeners who um, don't ha- do not have much background about wearables, and I just know this problem by you know doing girls that make the boxes, and you know, in a small box we have to fit some parts, and we teach you how to code. But then the battery, the problem of power is always there because you do not want a huge thing, even if you think about a double a battery you know some electrons usually you put two or four of them depending on the power it needs but can you have that on your garment you know it's almost impossible unless you're willing to carry the weight so right. that's those are the problem what Kathleen was ta- uh, talking about and the life with the small batteries are great but they also have their own danger so that's a problem and um, you know that's why she was talking about solar power which is great but again like even to get that amount you need that battery that that has a power inside and also a larger amount of solar um, surface in order to even capture that. So it is, you know, I think people always think, oh, wearable is the future, but then there's so much to solve before it it becomes the future. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. But I think, you know, it'll happen in tandem with other research, but Mm -hmm. something like flexible solar cells. I know there's research happening there, but if we have flexible solar cells and you can cover your whole garment, then we could really get a lot of energy. Um, You'd have a lot of surface area. Uh Okay. Wow. So I love this conversation because it really touches not just on the past, but just the future of what it could be. And this is just a discussion. 10 years, we might discuss something else. Yeah. Maybe, you know, as you said, biotech might be actually the wearable technology, you know, not just the solar power anymore. So, uh, you know, just for our listeners out there. <laughs> but then we'll have to learn something new. Forget oh, yeah. about programming. We'll now learn bio. <laughs> Right. Is there a website or something that you look at often to get updated on wearable technologies? Um, there are, and I don't have the, let me just give a real quick, uh, I look at Adafruit a lot, the Adafruit okay. blog, right. although yep. they tend to be really electrical, mm-hmm. um, but there's another one that I might have to send you later. Oh, it's okay. Yeah. I didn't mean to throw you on the spot, but it's just a thought that I quickly had. If anybody wanted to just to read a little bit about it. So Adafruit is a company that makes a lot of uh, boards, you know, and they, as uh, Kathleen said, they focus on um, electronics. So they write a lot about how to make things and why to make things, a lot of tutorials. So that's one great place to look at. There's another website, I forgot it's called Fashion Tech or something like that. Fashion Tech is really good. Yeah, okay. yeah. That Fashion great. Tech, I think, yeah. That, um, you know, that showcases Fashion Tech, literally. I think it's Fashioning, like I-N-G. Fashioning. Yeah. Fashioning Tech. Maybe I'm thinking of one. Um, and then there is a book that I read recently called Garments of Paradise by Susan Elizabeth Ryan. Okay. And then that is a really cool book that kind of covers a really broad range of wearables. And it includes some of the historical stuff I was talking about, like the watch. Wow. Amazing. Awesome. I mean, uh, I, I will read that first of all, the garments of paradise and I, I, all this podcast is going to be produced in a blog format as well. So we will make sure to put the exact title in there. Thank you, Kathleen, for sharing that. Okay. I really just want to talk about uh, gender diversity. I know we have been talking about it a little bit, but you said, you know, so I had a previous conversation with Kathleen, but she said she um, taught a school class and her advice as a lady did not go as well as the advice as the other male teacher. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. So what happened was I was teaching um, uh, as part of my research. So I wasn't a full-time teacher there. I was coming in as an outside researcher and I was coming in once a week and teaching a class with these students. But I was starting to know them pretty well. Mm -hmm. Um, And one of the male students was having a technical problem, which is a very common problem. So I'll just say what it is, which is if you, if you, if you have a sensor and you have motors Mm -hmm. and you're, you're trying to control both of these items from your Arduino, Mm -hmm. motors draw a lot of power especially Mm -hmm. if they have a load on them meaning any kind of like strain you're trying to push or pull something with them they start to draw a lot of power Mm -hmm. they'll draw all the power away from your sensor Mm -hmm. and you'll start to get some really weird erratic values for your arduino oh i see so the way to solve that is to give your motor a separate power supply Mm. which can seem a little weird, but you basically, you, you have your own battery for the motors and you have your own battery for your Arduino and you have to connect the grounds. Mm. 
I see. So that's the solution. That was the problem. Yep. I've come across it many times. So I felt confident to tell the student the solution, but he did not um, listen to me. Uh -huh. And I thought, hmm, okay. Uh, he just sort of ignored me. And then uh, later on in the class, an, another male teacher walked into the room. Um, and, and, you know, it may have been that he knew this teacher, you know, better than he knew me, but he asked him and he gave the same advice I'd given and the student followed his advice. Mm -hmm. um, and I've also had that happen with colleagues. Yeah. I gave a colleague once advice in a very similar situation and he tried every other solution. And then when he mm. finally tried my solution, he said, Oh, you were actually right. Uh, I was like, what is it about the way I've given the advice? You know, I mean, that's try to, how I try to think about it. There may, there's likely a gender bias there, but what, what can I do to overcome it? Because I want to be a good educator and I want to make right. sure that I'm heard. So <laughs> how do you feel about that? And what is the solution? Is there something you can advise us and our listeners? Yeah, I think I like, it's a hard one because hmm. in an ideal world, um, women shouldn't have to change anything about right. themselves to be heard. Uh, yeah. And so you don't want to be saying adjust yourself, mm -hmm. you know, for, but on the other hand, um, it's also complicated, right? I, I might be more likely to phrase something as a question, even if I'm really confident in it or to downplay my own knowledge, you know? And I, I think sometimes women will do that subconsciously or um, in academia or maybe elsewhere too, people talk about imposter syndrome, yeah. feeling like you don't deserve to be where you are or something. Mm -hmm. um, even though usually the people who feel that way yeah. are very self-aware and very qualified mm -hmm. to be doing what they're doing. So I think it's about trying to, um, find your confidence, mm -hmm. maybe fake it till you make it, as they say, mm -hmm. um, and to deliver things in, uh, in a way that's not a question, uh, because yeah, you're there to be the authority on the issue, I guess. I mean, and that's not to say, and it's a larger like pedagogy teaching question. You can obviously always take questions from students that you don't want to say, like, yeah. you're right, you're wrong, but uh, if it's something you know you're right on then. <laughs> but it, yes, in this case, it's very obvious. You know, there's exactly the same problem, same solution, but it depends on who this idea came from. Right. And, you know, I read many cases, you know, in business too, where, you know, an idea from a woman doesn't wait as much as an idea from a man, which is a very sad truth. But we just have to work around that. I mean, maybe the 22nd century it's going to be different. But right now we are still in a good place to have a voice. I, you know, things have changed a lot in the past, even five years, I would say. Yeah. And, uh, you know, obviously that's why we have girls that make too, you know, because we feel like it's the right moment, but I agree with you about the imposter syndrome, which is, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm not there. And the mm -hmm. statistic says, for a job, same job, male would apply if they think they're 30% qualified. Women would apply only if they're like 100% qualified. Even that, they question their abilities. That's crazy. And you know yeah. what else? Something happened to me similar recently is that I, I did not apply for a job. Very similar. I did not apply for a job at mm -hmm. a, a different university job mm -hmm. that I thought looked interesting, but I thought they wanted someone with an engineering background. Mm -hmm. I don't have an engineering undergraduate degree. Mm -hmm. And I later met the head of the department who was doing the search and she saw mm -hmm. my CV and she said, oh, I really wish you had applied. We were looking for someone like you. And I was like, ah, Ah, oh my God. What did I do? So I'll try mm -hmm. to keep it in mind for next. Time. Right. <laughs> I mean, this is a lesson for all of us. Even me, you know, as the founder of the CEO, I struggle with that, to be honest, because, you know, I always look uh, very critical about my skills, but sometimes it's not just that. If you feel like you have the confidence to do that, just push it as much as you can. And thank you for sharing your story, Kathleen, about, you know, your position that you did not apply for. So I think there's something to learn from for all of us over here right now. Yeah. yeah. So I think this is a good note to jump into this lady that we're going to discover just for a few minutes. Cool. And yeah, yeah I'm going to present her to all of you. So let me just share my screen now again. And every time at Girls I Make Podcasts, we are doing that. We are bringing a lady from history and we are going to discover about her achievement together because there are a lot of ladies who deserve some attention. So her Ooh. name is Sophie Germain. So Germain, um, very, you know, 1776 to 1831. So that was a long, long time ago, but let's see what she did. Can you see my screen, Kathleen? I can. Thank you. Yeah, perfect. All right. So we only have black and white images of her too, because obviously back then they didn't have the camera. So that's what we have. But she was a French mathematician, physicist, and philosopher. 
So all of those, but if uh, for our listeners, there's this picture left on a uh, black and it's not a picture, it's probably a, a drawing, a pencil drawing, where she's wearing a bow, long hair, and uh, kind of a blouse, dark blouse with white colors and a bow again. So that's her. And she's famous for her foundation work she did for mathematicians hundreds of years after. So, you know, she's a lady we don't really talk about at all. She's not someone famous, but she, it seems like she's done a lot of great work for um, the math world. And mm. her work on Fermat's last theorem, to be honest, I am not sure what this is, okay? Mm. <laughs> but it says it's a great contribution to math. And her work are on uh, some clutch, um, C-H-L-A-D-N-I, so Clatney number, laid the foundation for applied mathematics used today in the constructions of tall buildings. Now, this mm. is big because, you know, tall buildings, I mean, we have like 100 stories tall everywhere now. And her work have done a lot of um, good things because now we live in them, we're working them. So, you know, mm. it's just my two cents here that we should not forget about ladies like that. And, you know, I put some uh, equation over here, but I'm not going to talk about this right now. And she has some more work in the theory of elasticity. It's also important. So elasticity is, you know, when you have a rubber band and you pull it and, you know, all of this is used in our everyday mechanics and even that's maybe cool. in wearables, you know, how, how the elasticity works. So that's her work. Mm. And I know elasticity to some degree factors into tall buildings as well because they need to move right. in the wind. I wonder if that's related in uh -huh. her research. You're right. I mean, now with the, you know, the earthquake and all this too, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. have to have those thoughts. So it seems like she, you know, she did something great here. But here is the gender gap. Prejudice against gender. She was unable to make career out of mathematics. So she worked independently throughout her life. Here is a heartbreaking story. Her parents did not approve her fascination with math and would keep her room unlit and unheated so she could stop studying. Ah. Yeah, so, you know, that's a long time ago, but that's pretty sad because yeah. it seems that she could have done even more if she had the right environment. And filling the gender gap, she used a former male student name to get access to college notes. Mm. And after winning the Paris Academy of Science contest, she was still not allowed to attend its sessions because of the Academy's tradition of excluding women other than the wives of members. Wow. So she won the contest, but she, she couldn't attend it. That is ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's a long time ago, but it's right. like, wow. <laughs> yeah. you, know, it, it, you know, this is like 200 years ago. It still breaks my heart. Yeah. Um, and, and just then, like you said, like, it's important to know about these mm -hmm. women because yeah. it yeah. affects your interest in, in getting involved. If you can look at history and say, oh, look, here, here were other women doing in this mm -hmm. field. Yeah. So, you know, my takeaway from this was like, you just have to recognize that there was disadvantage. And, you know, it makes me feel great right now that we can even talk about this. We can bring this to light and look at you. You're working with technology and wearables all at the same time. And you're pursuing your PhD, you know, so that's the education that, you know, sh ladies like her could not have at yeah. that, you know, stage. But it makes me think about what if she was able to do that maybe our history could have been a little different and you know she was not allowed into college because of that so you know for any student who has you know the education I think it's something we should not take for granted so that's my few takeaway if you have any to share you know feel free Kathleen yeah, well, that's a good point, too, that she really wanted this education and was trying to fight for it. And nowadays, we often, you know, education, I know, can be a source of stress for a lot of students. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, you know, it's tied so much to right. what you're going to do when you get out and the cost. And, and those are very real concerns. But mm -hmm. um, it is important to remember, yeah, that it's get, getting access to education is, is a really great privilege. And hopefully people can find it, the aspect about it that they're excited about. Yeah. So, you know, that, that was Sophie Germain, just someone, you know, buried in history, but we're going to talk about um, her a little bit more in our blogs. 
but uh, we would love to just get some comments or other, you know, if you know someone we should research and post online, just let us know. Just put your comments out there too, because we would like to shine some lights on, on those ladies. <laughs> and uh, you know, Kathleen, if you have other words, you know, the final words for our audience who are teachers, mothers, you know, daughters or who want to inspire some girls and women out there, feel free to share. Oh, um, well, I think that. Hmm. Sorry, I wasn't prepared for that. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I sorry, I put you on the spot. There. <laughs> well, um, yeah, you know, I think it's, I think it's, there's, a, there's a combination of so many factors that have affected the gender gap for so long, especially in technology. Um, and it's really great to just have these conversations, like what you're doing, Claire, working to bring people together, because I do think that role models um, plays a huge difference. And that's why, you know, women getting written out of history really is an important issue. And, and so drawing light back to these women or um, that cool movie recently, Hidden Figures, also you know, drawing attention to the black women who worked on the space program was really amazing because you, you, you do look to people, even subconsciously, you look, you look at people in certain jobs and you try to decide, oh, is, is that something I could do? Um, and if you don't see anyone like you, then you might be a little less likely to go for it. Also, there was a very interesting study recently that um, I can find and link to you, but it showed that if, if you email someone to ask them to mentor you, they're more likely to say yes, just mm -hmm. statistically. If you're the same gender, sometimes mm -hmm. race is also a factor. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it does matter who's mm -hmm. in power. We all do have equal opportunities, mm -hmm. maybe, in terms of education, but it's, that, it's not really true because there's all these other things that come into play, right. like networking and, mm -hmm. you know, even the ways you limit yourself because of what you think you're capable of. So... I think people are doing amazing work and there are people out there who will say, Oh, it's not necessary anymore. Okay. You know, there's, there are some people on the other side of things who will claim that there is no longer an issue in terms of gender equality. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what I, what I learned that's from me. Yeah. Sorry, um, go on. <laughs> uh, you know, what I learned from you today is, you know, there's no limit of how you can take your education. You started with a sculpture, uh, a bachelor's in fine arts and you continued and obviously your future is you know it's going to be like right into the 21st century with what you're doing with wearables and the technology aspect of it so you're a great inspiration to all of us who is listening and uh, thanks for sharing all the books and things like that we're going to put out there and we look forward just to keep seeing you, you know, on not just on your Twitter, but also, you know, through your website that I'm also going to share. And, uh, you know, I hope that everybody continues and pursues their dream and um, take your words, uh, ask for mentorship because they're more likely to say yes. That's another thing I got from you today. Mm, okay, good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. you know... Don't be shy. If you have instances like Kathleen, when someone comes in a mail, you know, he gets it easier than you do. I mean, there's nothing we can do. We just got to keep going at it and be as confident as you can. Absolutely. And your listeners can feel free to reach out to me through my website. If you're ever trying to do a tutorial or you have a technical question, I really don't mind. I'm happy to answer any questions. See, that's awesome. You know, we can all work together, right? Definitely. Power each other. All right. Thank you very much, Kathleen. We wish you the best in everything you do. And see you next time. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Bye. Bye.